physics, I'm saying here's the science of basic processes. It's basically the science of all sciences. You can have biophysics. We have something called biophysics. Uh, you can have chemical physics. We have something called chemical physics. We have geophysics. We have all sorts of things. If you want to make a lot of money, go into geophysics because the oil companies love you. Unfortunately, you know, you don't know how long they're going to still be around because people don't like them anymore. Um, but it's a great way to make a lot of money right now if you only care about today. So I'm going to break the kinds of physics up into three kinds today uh, based on sort of their scales. This isn't the only way to do it. There are lots of ways to do it. And in fact, from each one of these things, you might see a little bit of a different um, thing going on. One will be fundamental physics. I'll talk about that first. Then there'll be applied physics, which has more to do with the scales of things that we worry about and the things that you'll actually be doing in the rest of your life, probably. And then astrophysics, which maybe a few of you will have to worry about, but not very many. Um, so these are all different scales. So you'll see that I go from 10 to the minus 35 uh, meters. Uh, that's called the Planck scale to 10 to the 25 meters, which is basically the radius of the known universe. It's a little bit larger than the radius of the known universe, but it looked nice if I put these exactly 20 orders of magnitude away. That's 10 to the 20 times each one of those things. So you see for applied physics, we're going from the proton radius to the planetary radius. That's a little bit smaller than the Earth, but not, ex not excessively smaller. So um, we've got this huge range of things that we look at in physics, and we look at things in all those ranges. There are people doing active research on all of these things. So um, I think the only two things that really, really need to be explained are the Planck radius and the radius of the universe. We think there's a radius of the universe. We also think that the universe is infinite. Just because we have two things that contradict each other doesn't mean we can't believe them both. Um, and there are different ways to talk about that. But, you know, there's an idea that there's a, sort of a known universe. So if we are here, there's only so far we can see. Um, actually, that's the wrong diagram. The right diagram would be something like this. So we are here, and if these red lines are um, light, and this is the universe, we can only see this much of the universe going backwards, and we can't see very much farther back than that. And since the universe was initially expanding, right, we're seeing the radius of the universe at some time in the past, but there is a universe, there is a limit there in that past somewhere, just like there's a limit now, which is larger. Uh, we have some sad news. I have some very sad news for you. You know, they talk about that thing called the cosmological constant. You may have heard of that. Um, you may have heard of dark energy. All that means is that not only is the universe still expanding, it means the ex universe is expanding faster and faster and faster and faster. And that also means that we're losing a little bit of the universe every year. We see less and less of the universe as time goes on because if, it, if the universe is accelerating, then light can't get back to us. So we're actually losing parts of the universe every year. So eventually there won't be any universe left because everything's expanding. Although we don't really know why, so maybe that won't work out, right? We don't really know much about that dark energy. That's why we call it dark energy. Um, the Planck scale, on the other hand, is another interesting thing. You may have heard of a black hole. Um, so if you had a black hole, then I'll go back to this guy, right? If you have a black hole, this is the radius called the Schwarzschild radius, and there's something inside and it emits a photon. The photon can't get out of that black hole. It gets stuck in there. Light cannot escape that black hole. We'll talk a little bit more about this later, but that means we have this area in here. We have this place for a given mass that um, we can't get out of. So for a very heavy thing like a star, a star a little bit heavier than ours, you end up with this black hole. And um, it's going to be of a 
reasonably large size, about you know the size of the sun or something like that. Um, but that radius is dependent on the mass. So if you had a plot of the Schwarzschild radius, Schwarzschild means black shield. It's named after a guy, but it just happens to be a great name for um, the event horizon of a black hole. That means that your Schwarzschild radius goes like that or something like that. So it gets larger and larger and larger as you get more and more mass falling into your black hole, it expands. Um, now, if that's true, we could go all the way down to a short shield radius of zero, and that would be fine. But there's some other thing called quantum mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, the better you know a position, the less well you know how fast it's going, or even sort of which way it's going. And the better you know how fast it's going, the less you know where it actually is. Um, now that velocity there is related to your kinetic energy. That kinetic energy is related again to your mass, which means that you end up with, with something called a Compton wavelength. So this is our Schwarzschild radius. That's unfortunate. And then this is our Compton, radi Compton radius or wavelength. And that's sort of the minimum size something can be with that mass. And the lower it gets, the lower that mass gets, basically the larger your error is and how big it is. So you end up with a plot like that instead. And this range here is called the Planck length. And that's 10 to the minus 35 meters or or so, they don't really know exactly what it is, but it's 10 to the minus 35 meters. And sort of we think that's the smallest anything can be, that's the smallest a point in space can be. So we'll talk about that a little more, but that means we have a smallest size in the universe, we have a largest size in the universe, and we have a bunch of stuff in the middle. So all the things we really care about though or in this area between the proton radius and the um, size of the Earth. Basically, this is actually the size of the moon, but that's okay, we'll live with that. So we've got these three things to look at, three different things we can look at, three different ways to look at the universe. Um, we'll start with fundamental physics because they have the least uh, to do with the real world. They live in their own brains and they start with an idea that what they're going to find are really, really the smallest and most important things um, in the universe. So those would be things like maybe electrons or quarks. And these would be something called fermions. That's and we also call those matter. They also look at things called forces. And the only one that you'd probably know is the proton, or not, not the proton, the photon, excuse me. Um, you may have heard of the Higgs particle, that's another force, another boson, as they call them, Higgs boson. Uh, let's see, there's a gluon. There really is something called a gluon in something called quantum chromodynamics, which keeps the quarks glued together to make protons and neutrons. And there may or may not be something called a graviton. Um, nobody really knows. So those are the sorts of things that fundamental physicists look at. And fundamental physicists, because what they care about is sort of categorizing things and figuring out how everything works together, they basically start by looking at classical mechanics as the basic rules for physics. Under some situational constraints, and we'll talk about those constraints right now. Um, but 
they start with classical mechanics, the stuff we're going to look at in this course. Then they say, okay, if we have, th if we have regular sort of things, we just have to worry about classical mechanics. But then when we get into heavy things, we'll add in gravitation. Universal gravitation is just Newton's law of gravitation. Um, you may remember it as, uh, let's see, how does that go? F equals G M M over R squared, that inverse square law of gravitation. That's a fundamental force, and that's also one of the pillars on this cube I'm going to make, all right? That's something that's, you know, completely within our ability to talk about in this class. Uh, the next one, if something goes really, really fast, that's special relativity. Uh, Einstein did that in 1905. It was a clean break from classical mecha mechanics. Not really a clean break, but it's a break from classical mechanics. And basically what that did is it took uh, Galilean re relativity, Galilean relativity, which is what we'll talk about in this class, and it turned it into this um, special relativity. And the difference between the two are in Galilean relativity, everybody sees the same thing because space and time are absolute. There's no mixing between space and time. In special relativity, space and time are relative, so space-time mixes. That is a little bit beyond this course. We won't talk about how that works, but there is a little bit of mixing between space and time. And it's not too weird, but we can make it weird if you want to. And then the third thing that they go, go away from classical mechanics with is by getting something really small, that's classical mechanics. Uh, wave mechanics in particular is what you're looking at there. And that's sort of the same thing I was talking about with the Compton wavelength. So when we're talking about classical mechanics, again, we're talking about the rules of the universe when things are reasonably light, reasonably small, and, or reasonably large, and reasonably slow. Um, all of these ideas are a little bit relative, but they all work together. Heavy things deal with gravity, small things deal with quantum mechanics, and fast things deal with special relativity. And that gets you to a spot of about, at about, like I said, 1905. Maybe you could add in a couple of years for quantum mechanics to fully develop. Um, Einstein won his Nobel Prize in 1905, not for special relativity, but for looking at something called the photoelectric effect, which was the first time that quantum mechanics was used to explain something. The photoelectric effect is basically what happens to generate a current in a kind of circuit when light hits a anode, I believe it is. I haven't, I haven't looked at that um, closely enough for a couple of years to remember what hits what. No, it hits the cathode, it hits the donor. All right, so the um, photoelectric effect, it's basically what's behind solar panels, um, and that is a completely quantum mechanical phenomenon. Um, and you can prove that if you go to the right class, um, but this won't be that class. However, Physics has evolved. Fundamental physics isn't moribund. They keep doing things. Um, the first thing that they did was general relativity, which basically said, okay, if something's both fast and heavy, what happens? Well, what happens there is space and time warp. And that's actually what we think right now, or at least to the best of our knowledge, happens with how gravity works, right? And they like to show something like this a lot of times, right? You'll say, okay, what's really happening is if you have a heavy thing like a planet or a star, then, you know, your straight lines look like that. So your straight lines sort of have to curve to accommodate that. And all sorts of interesting things happen like with that. Light does really bend because uh, the curve of this, um, 
uh, bending like a trampoline, like if you put a bowling ball in a trampoline, um, that curving affects the path, obviously, of any object that goes through it. And it's one important result of general relativity. Um, so that's more or less how we think gravitation works. We think gravitation is telling us how space-time is put together, what space and time are, what is space-time. That's what we think these days. Um, a little more recently, uh, this was probably finished in the mid-40s, was quantum field theory. Well, not finished. I guess the first good quantum field theory came in the mid-40s. That was quantum electrodynamics. Um, that was by Feynman, did a lot, um, Schwinger, and I think it's Tomogawa. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I've got the chat open. And so they got the Nobel Prize for QED. This is currently the best... Um, the best verified theory in the world. It's good to about one part in 10 to the minus 13, right? So if you take the value of, say, a prediction of QED, it's good to, um, you know, let's see, thousand, million, billion, trillion, better than one, one trillion, better than 10 one, one trillionths of a percent or 10 one tr tr trillionths of the thing. So I guess that's 100 billionths of a percent. So that's pretty good accuracy. Um, later on in the 70s, somebody invented quantum chromodynamics, which actually explains protons. This is the thing that has the um, quarks in it. Quarks are very strange things. They're, every quark has a color charge and you have to have one of each color in the thing and you can't pull you can't pull one quark away from the proton it just doesn't happen so it's a very strange theory and it's something that's really worth looking into if you like staying up at night um, and a currently active quantum field theory is called string theory And its job is to try to take these guys and integrate them with gravity. That's what it is now. When string theory first came about, it was trying to do the same job QCD eventually did. But it didn't quite work. So um, some other guys got a better theory. And then the string theorists said, oh, yeah, well, if we do this and this and this, we knew that all along. Um, and now they're trying to use it to integrate gravity into um, quantum mechanics. And well, actually, a little bit more than quantum mechanics, because this is special relativity, too. Um, if you just take gravity and quantum mechanics and try to integrate them, you have quantum gravity. That's an active area of research. Uh, basically, it's trying to look at things that are very, very small and figure out what space-time looks like in that situation. So they're trying to look at all of these little um, quantum bits of space-time, and there are some rules to how that goes together, which is why I'm redrawing things. Um, and then I missed that rule there, and that one there. Um, but basically what it's saying in a, well, I guess it, I can't say that. One of the ways to interpret it is that there's sort of this frothing foam of randomness at the bottom of the universe and the, tr and the people who do um, quantum gravity theories try to describe what that would be like and try to somehow build up general relativity from that. Uh, that's kind of their goal is to figure out how to take this, make real predictions about real things. Right now they're not doing that. They're still at the sort of level where they're trying to make sure that everything they say doesn't contradict them. It, doesn't contradict each other, that everything's internally consistent, as they say in mathematics. And what everybody would love, or at least the string theorists would, is a theory of everything. 
And basically the way that would work is that there's only one kind of stuff and depending on how you look at it or depending on what it's doing, it's um, going to have an aspect of maybe a photon or an electron or a quark. So that's what string theory is, is the different vibrational modes of the strings give you different, um, different particles. So in the case of gravity, what they want it to be is a um, graviton, like I said, although that's something we've never seen. And um, the other vibrational modes can be different things. Uh, there are some very scary things about string theory that I won't go into. So that's the world according to your fundamental physicist. Um, most of it you can learn about. You can't learn too much about quantum gravity or a theory of everything except that there are a bunch of different theories and none of them is correct. So you can look at all this stuff. You can talk about loop quantum gravity. You can talk about string theory, but right now there are mathematical artifices that don't really make good predictions or in the case of string theory, make more predictions than uh, you want. Or to, I guess a way to say that is they make every prediction, which is just as good as making no prediction. Because, there are, because in string theory, there are, what, 26 dimensions, and you have 26 little constants that you can change, which means you can fit just about anything that you want to fit just by changing those numbers. Um, not all this stuff that we're not going to do is meaningless. Obviously, for general relativity, if you want to do things with satellites in the future, eventually you're going to have to learn about that. It is important for, you know, um, satellite uh, research and, sat and satellite operations. Um, but universal gravitation and classical mechanics is what we're going to talk about in this class. And that's what most engineering is done for. Uh, but if you're going to do any sort of semiconductor um, work, all right, if you, if you think you want to work for Intel or something like that, um, designing chips, or if you're going to um, do materials work, so that's a lot of stuff in electrical or computer engineering. It's a lot of stuff in um, mechanical engineering then a lot of these quantum mechanical things are important. So when you go to College Station, you might consider taking Physics 222. Um, you might take it anyway, because it's just fun. This is a, this uh, modern physics, which it's called, is known to physicists as the fun stuff. So um, that's the fun stuff if you want to play with things that are weird and you know, you can talk to other people about at the bar. Um, so that was fundamental physics, the basic laws of everything in the universe. What would we like to look at next? Uh, we'd like to look at astrophysics um, here. We want to look at astrophysics because it's going to be the really big things. Um, theories of the interactions between very large objects at very vast distances. I guess you shouldn't say very vast. Um, they'll start with stars and planets and sort of um, stellar structure and things like that. You can also talk about solar systems and you can talk about um, galaxies. You can talk about galactic clusters and things like that. So these are the sorts of things that astrophysicists look at and all those have something to do with gravitation. Now, like I said, there's a little bit of an issue in uh, gravity, right? And the reason is, is because there's something called dark matter and they write um, that as the cosmological constant, lambda. The cosmological constant is a negative energy field that engulfs all of space and makes space expand, right? So not only are, is it causing things to, to um, be pushed away from each other, it's causing the amount of space to actually expand. It's a very, very strange um, thing according to the theories. So that they think we have to have this um, cosmological constant because of all that cosmic microwave background, background radiation that you've heard about. 
um, because it has an anisotropies, because it's not isotropic, because you can see different things in different places, you think that there's something pushing everything apart from each other uniformly. And so everywhere in space, there's just this little bit of energy, lambda, pushing everything apart uniformly in all directions. So that's um, very, very strange. But what that means is traditional general relativity doesn't work, which means that these guys have to look at different ways to modify um, gravity, general relativity. And the first way they do that is with this cosmological constant. But this is not very satisfying. And it's not satisfying because you're just adding a number in there and you don't know what it is. Right, Einstein, when he first uh, made general relativity, noticed that his theory didn't give what the astronomers thought was correct. So he added the cosmological, cosmological constant in there just to create a universe that would actually start contracting, which is what the astronomers thought in 1920. And then a little bit later, they said, oh, wait, that was wrong. Now we think it's just going to expand until it sort of stops and never collapse. Or I guess you've all taken calculus, so it's going towards a limit, like in calculus, but it never gets past that um, maximum size. So um, in that case, that cosmological constant would be zero. And that's when Einstein said, introducing that cosmological constant was my greatest mistake. Then about whatever it was 15, 20 years ago, when they um, saw that cosmic microwave background radiation signal, they, the astronomers said, well, we have to add something like that cosmological constant in there. Now, what is it? Now, there's some ideas that may work, right, for generating an energy, a negative energy like that. There's something called the... Um, vacuum fluctuations. Basically, it's a quantum mechanical effect where you might expect from quantum electrodynamics that there was a little bit of a gap, a tiny little gap between the lowest possible energy and the energy of a single object. And that would give you something like a cosmological constant. And it would be about 10 to the 120 times larger than what we measure for the cosmological constant. There would never be a universe if that was, that was true. So that's basically the only physical reason people can give for that. So people keep thinking about ways to do that, different ways to um, modify QED or maybe find something in quantum gravity that would mitigate that in some way. Um, the other way to do that is say, Einstein got gravity wrong, so GR, gravity, general relativity, is wrong, and so you can modify gravity in some way, and people try that as well, but modifications of general relativity usually do really bad things, so nobody's found a viable candidate for that, for that. maybe not a viable candidate, but a really good candidate for that. There are a couple of interesting um, candidates for gravitation, but they don't really work out very well. So that's sort of what uh, astrophysicists do. Now we're stuck with applied physics. Uh, the thing is, is those are usually these complex interactions between multiple objects. We've got the basics down for mechanics, right? We've got the basics down for thermodynamics as well, but there's a lot of work to be done in this whole statistical approach to physics, which is what goes on there. Um, part of that is complexity theory, catastrophe theory, you know, how many little beans can you pile up before the pile collapses? People do that sort of thing. Um, they do it in more important uh, sort of applications, but that's sort of the easiest way to get your eye, get your eye, or not your eye, get your head around that. Um, you know, just go to Kroger, buy a big bag of beans, dried beans, and pile them up and see that, you know, once you get them to a certain level, they all fall down, right? Um, you can do it with sand if you want, but it's not as fun. Uh, 
And then materials physics, which is really, really important, like I sort of implied for doing work in industry. So for hard drives, for magnetic um, materials for hard drives, there's a lot of work that goes on with that. That's sort of what I did. For um, semiconductors, there's a lot of work going on in materials physics for that. For more advanced electronics, for things like spintronics, where they actually take the magnetic moment of the electron and try to encode information in that so your current can encode, your current itself can encode information. You can pass information between things just by passing a current through it. That's yet another um, thing going on with materials physics. Uh, graphene, uh, two-dimensional uh, two dimensional objects, I mean, truly two dimensional um, materials, things like that. All that sort of stuff is in materials physics. So that is sort of what physics looks like, at least to me today. Okay, are there any questions at this time? Okay, I'm getting no questions. Oh, was that somebody? Nope. All right. Okay. Oh, I don't like that. So the science of mechanics is fully codified. Uh, mechanics describes the rules of the world. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about what we'll be doing in this class. Um, so what we'll really be looking at here is Newtonian mechanics, Newtonian physics. Um, that's basically the physics of forces, and it got built up at the same time as calculus. So they're completely intertwined, right? In order to make physics work, Isaac Newton had to uh, invent the calculus to make, to make it work correctly. Otherwise, it didn't quite work. Um, and that means we have mechanics, which is the physics of pushes and pulls. So whenever you're thinking about forces later on, you can just think, think about pushing something or pulling something or dragging something, something physical like that. That's always going to be important for the calculus or for the mechanics for uh, Newton's laws. Um, and so that's what we're basically going to look at in this class. There are other ways to build that up. There's Hamiltonian mechanics, which is going to use the energy to figure out paths. And there's also Lagrangian mechanics, which also uses the energy, but in a very strange way. Um, both of these use something called the calculus of variations to figure things out. That's a little bit beyond what we can do in this class. So basically you'd want to get it, get at least through calculus three, maybe to um, calculus uh, or through differential equations before you look at the calculus of variations. Um, but, you know, that still ends up being something that like chemical engineers and mechanical engineers are good at. So one of the things that happened to me in graduate school was that I had to worry about this calculus of variations for some of my research. And there was a book it actually talked about the sorts of things maybe that I was doing, which are dissipative systems, systems that lose energy. So how could you really do that in these complex situations? Um, could you use this calculus of variations? And I found this book that was all about it sitting in my office right now. And because I checked it out three times. So if I check out a book three times from the library, I buy it because obviously it's useful. And obviously, after I bought this, you know, $150 book, I never used it again. But, um, you know, I looked at this book, and it had the name Stan Jones on it. It was by a guy named Stan Jones. And, you know, one of my um, professors, actually the chairman of the um, physics department at that point, at the University of Alabama, was Stan Jones. So I opened up to the um, 
page that had his name on it, the title page. And it's there it said Stan Jones, University of Alabama. And right under it said Department of Mechanical Engineering. It was a different Stan Jones. They had two Stan Jones, um, one in physics, one in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, and he did that. Uh, calculus of variations is this really awesome thing, though. Um, it can prove things like the shortest distance between po two points. You can't do that with even normal calculus. You can't prove that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Um, but what the calculus of variations does is it it's able to take all of these little deviations like this orange thing from the little blue line and say, well, is this longer or is this shorter, right? And it throws that into an integral and pop, out it comes that the straight line is the shortest distance between two points. Now, a little bit later on in a couple of weeks, we'll be doing some stuff with great circles on a sphere and you're going to do some comparisons, right? You can do you can do a comparison between a straight line and you know a deviation like that, and say, yeah, the straight line is shorter. But what you can't do with your tools is prove that it's shorter. And so we'll do the same thing with um, stuff a um, two points in the uh, on the Earth. We'll sh and we'll show that if a path is on one of these great circles that is shorter than what looks like a straight line. So this curves path on the surface of the earth, along the surface of the earth is shorter than what you might think of as a straight line. Like say, if you just go straight east for between two points, it takes longer than going a little bit north to get there on a curve. So it's a, it's a little bit, this is actually a longer path. It's a little bit weird. Um, but you can actually show that here, but that's still a comparison between two points. Calculus of variations can show it between every single path, and that's what's really interesting. Um, now that's just a little bit mathy, but if you look at this um, Rastachrome pro problem, crone, uh, basically it means least time. Uh, what it's saying is that I can create this cycloid here and if I were to let a ball roll down the cycloid, it would get to the end here before a ball that went straight down this way. And what you're doing is you're taking the force of gravity and the um, constraints along this curve, this path, to find basically what is the path that optimizes the fact that you know, if I start with a steep angle, I speed up real fast, right? And then I can slow down, I can slow down my acceleration later on and still get here faster. So that's something that you can do with Lagrangian mechanics. And it's really, really cool. But again, it's a little bit um, more complicated. We'll just look at Newtonian mechanics. I will do that in four parts. We'll do kinematics which is basically math. Then we'll look at Newton's laws, conservation laws, and extended bodies, all right? Uh, so kinematics is math that's sort of put into the language of physics. So we'll talk about derivatives with respect to time. We'll talk about um, velocities and accelerations and things like that. Um, that's basically what we're going to do with kinematics. So what I really mean by kinematics is math. We'll also do dimensional analysis. And coordinate systems. And that will give us something that we can work with over and over. So both of these guys will do over and over. Uh, we'll have problems that require you to understand these coordinate systems in each module. Now, usually what happens is that teach a little bit about vectors 
and then we ignore them until you get to extended bodies, at which point they become critical again, but you've forgotten everything from down here. So that's the reason why you're going to see so many problems asking you vector questions, is I want you to keep the vectors in your brain so that when you get over here at the end, you don't get lost, okay? Because they're important here, they're important for the first part of Newton's laws, and then a lot of times they'll just go away for a month and a half or two months and then people lose it. So we don't want you to lose those vectors. They're very important and they're going to keep coming back for the rest of your career. Um, then we have Newton's laws. Newton's laws are really just about Newton's laws and we'll talk about forces. We'll talk about different kinds of forces along the way. Uh, conservation laws that's conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, and conservation of angular momentum. And then for extended bodies, we'll add, add some torque and um, other sorts of rotational motion. We'll talk about rolling objects and we'll talk about spinning things and stuff like that. So an extended body will be something where you have to worry about rotation. There's a more technical definition, but we don't have to worry about that now.